Jurassic Park, calling it one of the biggest movies of the 90s, would hardly be an understatement. From its impact on the public's perception on dinosaurs to influencing a generation to pursue careers in paleontology, biology, and cinematography. There's a lot of praise that can be given to this film and its long list of sequels. But that doesn't mean it's free from any wrongdoings. There's a lot that needs to be unpacked about the problems with the series, but I can't really do that without at least giving a basic summary of what happens. Don't worry, I'm not going to give a long, drawn-out, and detailed synopsis on the whole series of six films. Only the basic premise behind how the films set up their plot with science. The series is based off of the two-book series Jurassic Park and The Lost World, written by Michael Crichton in 1990 and 1995, respectively. Its plot starts long before the first scenes of the movie and the book, with the billionaire philanthropist who is weirdly obsessed with theme parks and circuses, John Hammond, who hires Dr. Henry Wu to bring back dinosaurs using DNA found in mosquitoes that were preserved in amber and modern genetic engineering techniques. After getting his park set up, dinosaurs created and investors secured, Hammond runs into a few minor setbacks with incidents of workers being attacked or killed, escaped dinosaurs, you know, things that are bound to be common at a zoo set up on a tropical island with creatures that haven't been alive in nearly 65 million years with practically zero regulation and oversight. Oh, and did I mention they were off the coast of Costa Rica, you know, in an area that is known for its constant run-ins with tropical storms and hurricanes? It's a major plot point in the movie, but kind of irrelevant to our news. Anyway, in order to reinsure to his investors and the insurance companies that everything is a-okay at his park, Hammond agrees to bring a group of experts to his amusement park slash zoo to check on its safety. And who better to do that than a mathematician, a paleobotanist, and a paleontologist? Clearly, you don't need the opinions of people who work in zoos, theme parks, insurance auditors, etc., etc. The A-plot kicks off when the chief programmer in charge of all the security software decides he's going to attempt to, uh, some light corporate espionage because John Hammond didn't want to pay him a fair wage for his work and didn't want to hire on at least two other people to make sure his one guy wasn't getting overworked. In the process of doing so, he turned off all the park security systems, including the pens that house the dinosaurs, you know, like the T-Rex and the raptors. Seriously, this whole series of unfortunate events that occurs next could have been prevented if it weren't for corporate greed. Naturally, fun times ensue, nearly everyone dies, and they find out that the dinosaurs, which are genetically engineered to all be female and are sterilized, are breeding on the island setting up every other sequel in the main story. In later films, they utilize genetic engineering to create custom hybrids of dinosaurs that are bigger, louder, more teeth. In something that I can only assume at this point is more of a critique on the summer blockbusters that the original Jurassic Park movie inspired. There's a really good video about it that I'll try to remember to put in the description. So there are two major elements to what is wrong with Jurassic Park, and I don't really think that I can compose a singular video that would keep your attention long enough to fully explain them both. Those two things are how the dinosaurs are fundamentally wrong, and how they use genetic engineering is flawed. And in order to understand the former, we have to tackle the latter first. What is genetic engineering? For anyone who knows, I am going to oversimplify the topic so that I can at least get most people to the basic understanding. Also, why are you watching this? You probably know more about the subject than I do. I'm not saying to click away, I, I just want to know. Leave a comment down below. At its core, genetic engineering is the modification or manipulation of an organism's genes using technology. You can see it as a natural progression to the methods that we had originally cultivated at the dawn of civilization, like selective breeding. If you look at corn, cattle, and most things that we use as food in the modern world, most of them do not resemble the wild ancestors that we developed them from. In the case of Brassica oleracea, 
We don't even recognize them all as being the same species. That's cabbage, cauliflower, kale, and Brussels sprouts, if you weren't aware. Selective breeding is effectively a simplified way of modifying the genes of a singular species. What takes us into the realm of genetic engineering requires a little more involvement at the smallest of levels. CRISPR is an acronym standing for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats and is a family of DNA sequences found in some bacteria and most archaea. Cas9, or CRISPR-associated protein 9, is an enzyme that uses CRISPR sequences to break apart DNA strands that are complementary to itself. There's a number of these including Cas12A and Cas13, but it's the function that we are most focused on here. Utilizing these and other related sequences, we can effectively go into the genetic code of an organism to remove and insert strands of DNA. When you hear a story about how they made a caterpillar produce spider silk or how they're putting whale genes in a cow, this would be the type of technology that they use to do that. Although the whale cow was something that I made up and I don't think that they've actually done. You're probably sitting there thinking, this doesn't sound incredibly different from what they did in the movies, and you would be correct. It's not. In the film, they had an incomplete DNA that they filled with the genes of amphibians to get a complete sequence, and then utilized real-world processes to create a viable embryo. So where's the problem? Well, there's two of them. It seems that I really like that number today. Anyways, the first problem comes from the source of the DNA. DNA naturally breaks down over time, to the point to where it couldn't be collected from any source older than something in the ballpark of 10,000 years old. And that's assuming it's a direct source, which takes us to our second issue. In the case of the mosquitoes, even if they were young enough to provide DNA that hadn't been decomposed due to time, you'd still only be getting the DNA of a mosquito. It's like assuming you'll get a hamburger out of the stomach of a guy who ate one a few years ago. That's clearly not happening. If you were paying attention here, you'll notice that I never said that the general idea of the film was impossible. The impossible thing is getting what would be considered a dinosaur to the public. Hopefully this next segment will help you understand why. There are currently a number of projects trying to do something very similar to Jurassic Park in one way or another. The easiest ones to start with are the direct comparisons that can work. There are currently two major projects going on in the world right now that are doing exactly what they did in the first film. Man, there's that number again. Okay, it's not exactly two, but it's just easier to split them into two projects. The first is related to mammoths. There are a number of private groups attempting to resurrect the giant beasties. Some of them have legitimate reasons for doing it, and others are just publicity stunts to say that they could do it. And while a publicity stunt is nice to see every once in a while, I'd rather not see one at the expense of an animal that was only created for said stunt. Most of them don't even know what they'll do with the animal after they brought it back and are probably just hoping someone will take it off their hands. Which brings us to one of the few that have a legitimate reason for doing it. Pleistocene Park is an endeavor in Siberia to revitalize the Eurasian steppe ecosystem in order to slow down the melting of the permafrost. They aim to do so by introducing or reintroducing species into the environment that were present in the Pleistocene, some of which are currently on the verge of extinction. But the biggest one that they aim for is the woolly mammoth. Now, I'm not going to explain exactly how or why this would work to slow down the melting of the permafrost. It's complicated. So just suffice to take the simple explanation that animals have a major impact on their environment. The second major project comes from down under on the island of Tasmania. There they intend to revive and reintroduce the thylacine, more commonly known as the Tasmanian tiger. The hopes for this project are to reintroduce the native apex predator in order to control populations of pest species, invasive species, and to stimulate growth in the dying forests of the island. If you've ever seen anything about the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone, it's effectively the same idea. Unlike the plans to bring back the mammoth, this one has a much greater chance of success. The reason for that is because the thylacine didn't go extinct until 1936. As you could probably imagine, reviving something that went extinct less than 100 years ago is much easier than reviving something that went extinct around the same time that the pyramids were built. You didn't know that there was an isolated population of mammoths still alive at the same time that the pyramids were built? Well, now you do. So let's talk about the other method. 
direct genetic modification of DNA to create a dinosaur. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? Well, it's kind of not. Uh, Jack Horner, who is probably the most famous paleontologist on the planet because of his role as a technical advisor for the majority of the Jurassic Park films, as well as being the partial inspiration for Dr. Alan Grant in the movie, wrote a book in 2009 called How to Build a Dinosaur, Extinction Does Not Have to Be Forever. In it, he described a plan to recreate a dinosaur by modifying the DNA of a chicken. With a little bit of funding from George Lucas, he started a team that had some success with their Chickenosaurus project. Uh, they managed to get a chicken embryo to grow a tail. And another independent team managed to turn the beak into a dinosaur-like snout. And a team from the University of Chile produced embryos with dinosaur-like legs. Now, there's a lot of ethical questions you could ask about all these methods and projects, but I'm not really here to answer those. That's completely up to you if you think it's right or wrong. But if you were trying to do what they did in Jurassic Park, these would be the methods that you used to do it. That's assuming you could afford to spare no expense, of course. Well, thanks for watching all the way through the video. Um, it was really fun to make. There will be a second follow-up video to this answering the question of why the dinosaurs are wrong in the Jurassic Park films. I still got to write that script out, and I'm fairly certain I'm going to go off on a tangent that is completely unrelated to why the dinosaurs are wrong, because it gives me a chance to talk about a lot of things that are related to dinosaurs, and I'm sure most of your inner childs can agree with me that dinosaurs are amazing. So that'll be out probably in the next two or so weeks after this video comes out, hopefully, if I'm on, on my game with this one, unlike the last time. So anyways, I'll see you then, and uh, make sure to come back so you can figure out what's with all the tubes. Bye.